Hi, welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today we're not taking a field trip, we're going to do some hard work, at least in my view, some hard work. And I want to talk about a supplement, and I want to talk about how you use this supplement and how many people have been misusing this supplement, have been misguided. And in fact, it's working against them for their particular intentions. So what we're going to talk about is berberine. Should you use it? Should you not use it? What's the good side? What's the bad side? We've talked about the good side before, and this particular um, link is right here to that particular YouTube. But now we're going to talk about the dark side of berberine and why you might not want to take it, why it might be thwarting your, your efforts to build muscle mass. Let's start from the top. So berberine and muscle protein synthesis is what we're talking about. What you need to know is when we talk about berberine, you hear this term AMPK, AMP kinase if you prefer. And before we get into that, I want to say there's basically kind of two mechanisms, a yin and yang in the whole body. You're either building it up, you're either growing, think of yourself as a kid, but also in a process of the whole body. We go through this on a daily basis. Or you're in just the opposite. You're breaking things down. Why would you be breaking things down other than getting old? You'd be breaking things down because you need the energy. You need to break. So when you think of fasting or fasting when it goes to starving and starving when it goes to death, is it that path with that road of not having any food throws your body into a sense of emergency saying, uh-oh, where am I going to get my calories? How am I going to live? Nothing's coming in the mouth. What do we do? What's the backup system? We talked a little bit about that before when we talked about fasting, which is up in this particular link here, that you know we do have backups. We have packets, as I say, of collagen. They're kind of like the portable little battery that is in our muscles, it's in our liver, it's in our kidneys even, and we get to use that for a while. So that takes for a day or two, then we're kind of out of it. What happens then? Well, then we step into a thing called gluconeogenesis, which is making, making glucose from proteins. So that's kind of like the simple, clean progression of what happens when you fast. Also, so that is AMPK is the activative, it's the body sensor for, do I need energy? Do I need it? Am I, is this an emergency? Do I need to call in all sources of energy? In other words, start burning fat, soak up all the glucose I can out of the bloodstream into my muscles as soon as possible. And the other emergency would be is if there's a bear chasing you in the woods, right? It's all mechanisms on board to make energy. So those are the two emergency situations in which create or initiate or trigger AMPK. Okay, so you got that? Well, the opposite of that is building. When you build muscle, muscle protein synthesis that we talked about a lot through the protein sparing modified fast, which I'm a big fan of obviously, but that's about mTOR. mTOR is the opposite. It's the yin and yang. Mammalian target of raptamycin. Fancy name and who cares, right? But it's about you trigger that and a few things trigger it besides raptamycin. Um, leucine, some people think uh, branch chain amino acids, but leucine in particular, we talked about that. You know, what is the quintessential? It's you need the proteins to build your muscles. So that means you need all of your essential eight or nine essential amino acids, but you really need more of leucine to trigger that. So you got building, you have AMPK, which is just the opposite, is breaking things down. So the two words are catabolism, breaking things down, all mechanisms on board to give us energy. This is an emergency. This is an emergency. Either our fasting is going on too long, you know, so it's our fat supplies. We don't have fat supplies. We're in, we're in a deeper, more dangerous situation and or the bear is chasing us in the woods. So we'll call that exercise, but it's extreme exercise. Okay, then let's move on. So here's what mTOR does. It's basically growth factors. Uh, the thing about mTOR is you really can't measure it by itself and you can't really measure growth hormone by itself. So what you do is you measure it, what they call a proxy. So you measure 
IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And we'll get to that. We're going to end up looking at labs, and we're looking specifically on that. So that's how we get to sense if somebody have a high amount, or relatively high amount, or a low amount. And what does that tell us about that particular metabolism of that person? So it's growth factors go through mTOR, and there's two complexes. Just, we're not going to get into it. Uh, protein synthesis, biogenesis, cell survival, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now here's a couple of ways to look at AMPK. I want you to see things in different ways. So AMPK is about making glucose. We need sugar. We need energy, right? Think of energy. So it goes to glucose metabolism. It increases glucose uptake. It decreases gluconeogenesis. So your liver is not going to be making glucose. It's going to be, we're going to be turning on lipolysis. We're going to be burning fat. So burn fat, suck up the available glucose, uh, lipid metabolism, increase uh, lipolysis, as I just said that, beta oxidation, which is the burning of fat, decrease cholesterol. Um, you're going to increase autophagy, right? We want all the garbage bits and pieces of our cells in uh, mitophagy, which is the mitochondria is going to break down and remodel itself. This is the big praise of AMPK. I'm doing autophagy. I'm getting rid of the old garbage. I'm taking out the garbage. Easy analogy to think about, right? And I'm building a new one. That's what fasting is all about. Good thing about fasting. It's a little bit of exaggerated, but that's why you would do this. This is what happens. So in general, we're about decreasing the consuming pathways, right? We're on survival. We're on survival. Um, and we're increasing ATP producing pathways, glucose sparing, increase energy. Another way of looking at it for muscle, it's going to suck up the glucose in the uh, bloodstream. Um, it's going to start shifting to fatty acid oxidation. So that was ketones. And heart's pretty much the same thing. Fatty acid, glycolysis is going to burn whatever glycogen's around. Glucose uptake, uh, your appetite's going to increase. Food intake, you want energy. Uh, liver, fatty acid th synthesis, gluconeogenesis. And your fat tissues, they're going to burn, right? So your fat is now going to be priority fuel burning material. And pancreas, insulin secretion, that's what gets the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the muscles, which is where we, where, where we want it. Okay, another way of saying it, and I'm repeating this on purpose, is that we're increasing glucose uptake and usefulness, utilization, sucking it out of the bloodstream, as I say. Fatty acid oxidation, we're burning ketones. Autophagy, that's the big advertisement for AMK, AMK, AMPK. Autophagy, everybody wants autophagy. Glycogen synthesis, fatty acid synthesis, protein synthesis, cholesterol synthesis, all those are shut off. And so the reason AMPK is such a big deal is because it is burning all these things, it's breaking down all these things, and it's associated more with reduced rates of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cancer not directly, but indirectly, because it's the opposite of mTOR. So all those other things are associated with high IGF, which we're going to look at, and building things. So they, you want to be in the opposite. So they say, well, you know, you'll increase your or decrease your cancer risk by being in uh, AMK, AMPK uh, as much as possible. So therefore, take these particular supplements that will help you do that. Now I'm going to come, I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but I want you to pick up that point. It might not be the best thing for you all the time. You don't always break things down. Otherwise, that's what death is, breaking things down. There's a point of building things up. mTOR is very important to muscle stimulation, and you need that. All right, so here's what I say. Step one, AMPK inhibits, stops, suppresses muscle protein synthesis. Have no doubt. AMPK activated protein kinase suppresses protein synthesis. 2002. So this is not a new topic. This isn't hot off the hot off the press. This is two decades ago, nearly. So we knew this two decades ago, but you're not hearing it because it doesn't behoove the supplement companies to say, "Oh, that berberine you're taking 
you're, it's probably going to help you get sarcopenia. So if you want sarcopenia, take berberine. Nobody says that, but that is in fact the case. Okay, you can look that up. There's a link. Here's in 2021, right up the road at Duke here, says about amino acid. They're studying muscles, of course. It's become a new era in the last couple of decades of study. Amino acid trafficking and skeletal muscle protein synthesis. All right, what about it? First thing they say, AMPK targets mTOR to suppress protein synthesis. Oh, really? So almost 20 years after that other study, we're now getting a confirmation. And there's in rats and mice, and rodents, and so on and so forth. Okay, on and on, and you can chase that if you want to. Now, step two is muscle mass index as a predictor of longevity. It means you need muscle mass to live a long, healthy life. If you don't have muscle mass, or put it this way, muscle mass is the number one correlation for all-cause mortality. As you get weak, you are much more vulnerable to dying from a lot of different things, both diseases and accidents and so on and so forth. I should have been step two, uh, step three, excuse me, excuse my steps. So step four would be specifically, you need not just muscle mass, but you need type two fibers. They go, oh, now it's getting complicated. Type two, type one. Well, no, it's not that complicated. Type two is about strength. It's about strength. Type one is about, you can go out for a walk. You can walk around the block. You can go out for a little jog. Those are type one, but strength, to be able to pick up that 100 pound weight, that takes strength. And in order to do that, you need to have strength resistance training. So anyways, I wanted you to know that number one was muscle mass is correlated with all cars mortality. And the most important, this is specifically you need type two muscle types, strength type, type two muscle fibers, strength to claim that muscle mass. Conclusion, reduced muscle mass with aging is mainly attributed to smaller type two muscle fiber size, meaning you just don't have, they shrink. They don't go away, they shrink. Uh, the increased muscle mass following prolonged resistance type exercise is attributed to these muscle fibers getting bigger. So hypertrophy, getting bigger muscles, is because you've worked out, but you've strength trained. You didn't go out for a jog. You didn't do cardiovascular exercise on the bike or the elliptical or the, or the row machine. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying you did not become stronger because you did that. You could become stronger because you do high intensity weight resistance training. That's why you become stronger. So think of sarcopenia. You don't do this, you get sarcopenia. You do this, you reduce the chances of sarcopenia. So we learned about proteins important. Actually, we're coming up to that. Um, we learned that muscle mass is important. That's why it reduces sarcopenia. And that process starts as early as 20, 20, uh, 25 to 30, but really is well established after 45. Step three is the appropriate amount of protein supports, stimulates muscle protein synthesis, MPS. We've talked about that in a number of different YouTubes. Feel free to look at the links posted here for most efficient way to do a protein sparing modified fast. And that's why people do a PSNF. So how you calculate what's the appropriate amount of protein for yourself in the course of the day, and you break it up into four different eating times, as we say. So there's two studies on that. Okay, um, step four. Now let's look at the labs. This is all about berberine, remember, right? Berberine's all the craze. And I did a previous video on berberine with the protein sparing modified fast, leaving it sort of up in the air whether you should do it or not. And we're gonna go, this is what we're doing right now. Okay, so what we're looking at right now are, is a lab sheet. And so we have two individuals, they're both on anti-diabetic medication, one's on berberine and the other's on metformin, which is pretty interesting. So we'll see some overlapping effects, but what we're looking for is a decrease in IGF because that's gonna be the surrogate for the growth hormone and that represents mTOR. Right? So what happened to it? It's going to squelch, it's going to suppress, it's going to block, it's going to inhibit as best as it can, never turn it off completely, their growth side of things, making protein, making whatever, because um, it's big in AMPK, remember. Okay, so let's look at this. So what we have is in the middle of the page, we have IGF. 
And I put IGF with insulin right above ins insulin because they're often loosely correlated. People who are pretty highly diabetic have a fairly high, within normal ranges high, um, and sometimes not within normal ranges high, with their insulin. And of course their, their glucose is arguably not controlled. Okay, so let's just go across. And so we have IGF, so we have some numbers here. We go, oh, there's a low number. I wonder why that number is so low. Well, that happens to be an older, older woman. What else? And she has a roaringly high glucagon. Well, it ends up that she has very low insulin, uh, very low iron, and that's causing a kind of an internal crisis for the body to sort of come together here. But the IGF, the point of the IGF is low. It's perhaps the lowest of this particular page of people. And that you could say, well, it's a good thing. So she's either very much an AMPK or her body is not about growth. Um, she's mid 70s. So you could say, well, that's, that's okay. So as we get older, that IGF tends to go down. So the onus is on us individually to induce it to work for us. So that's where the high intensity training comes from. You have to go to the gym or do it. There's other ways to do it. You do it at home. It's just easier at the gym. 15 minutes twice a week. That's not too much really. Um, and you go slow with whatever weight it is. It's not about weight. It's about intensity. Remember that. It's not about weight. It's about intensity. Not about running around the room. It's not about being on the bike machine. It's not about being on the elliptical. It's about slow, intense exercise. And that will trigger your adrenal glands to trigger your growth hormone momentarily. Pulsatile, if you will. Okay, let's go across. Look at the lows. Look at, oh, that's glucagon, sorry. IGF, come across IGF. Okay, we have, here's an 86. Everything else is 125, 147, 86. And we have another one if we scoot down, 86. Happens to be, these two guys are pretty much around 50. Uh, both diabetics. One is not that aware that he's a diabetic. This is one's on metformin, which suppresses the growth hormone, right? Um, it wants to, because it has other good effect factors as well. It will reduce cholesterol. It will reduce your blood glucose from what it was to a lower number. It will ideally sensitize your insulin. That's a good thing if you're a diabetic. Um, it will decrease your triglycerides, they say. So all these good indications, and we'll get to them in a second, but I want you to see that it is effective and it does do these things. And if these guys were wearing a glucometer, just measuring their, their glucose, they would see, which is right up here. So this person who's a diabetic, he's 104, that's not a bad number, just barely out of range. Well, if he wasn't on metformin, it would probably be 190. So it did a big deal there. Let's go over to the other guy. The other guy is, he was 86. Look at his insulin. They're both outrageous. So what the berberine in this case suppressed his growth hormone. Um, who knows how, how, how high that would have been. His glucose is 113. How high that would have been? Probably up around 200. So it's it did improve from what it was before. If they're wearing a glucometer, they would get to see when they're taking their medication, it would go down and then back up. So the problem I have here is that these people do not know that they are blocking their ability to make muscle mass as they get older. So one's mid 50 getting older and the other's a little bit younger. And so they are setting themselves up for worse sarcopenia than they would otherwise have. Yeah, they. I hope that they're working out. Um, so that is a big deal. So what, what would you do? Well, you have to add it. Would this person take berberine? Should they continue to stay taking berberine? You have to look at, wow, he has, he has a lot of factors that are going to be addressed by berberine and improved, or we're looking at the improved numbers, by the way. So maybe he should be taking berberine and maybe he should do a timing thing and try to go work out when he's, you know, the, the greatest time away from taking berberine. That might be one way of doing it. That would be not perfect, but it would be better than nothing. So now we look at other people. I guess my summary here on this particular thing is by looking at these things is saying that, you know, if muscle mass, if you're on a protein sparing modified fast for building muscle and you're taking berberine because you think that's going to help your blood glucose go down, you are thwarting, you're inhibiting, you're suppressing your ability 
to make muscle mass. So you may want to consider either taking a lesser dose or taking a dose that's far away from the time you're going to the gym to do high intensity training, right? To build those type two fibers up, those strength fibers. And that would be a way to do it. Okay, so we've been talking about berberine and muscle protein synthesis. So now when you review berberine, look at all the studies that are coming out um, about berberine or have been out for a while, you know, the 5,000 studies. Supporting healthy glucose metabolism with berberine, of course. Uh, berberine, treating metabolic syndromes naturally. Well, uh, berberine is a synthesis, is a one molecule subtracted from herbs. Uh, berberine lowers glucose and improves insulin sensitivity, correct. Berberine treats diabetic complications, correct. Berberine lowers cholesterol and near, nearly as well as statins, correct. We've seen that in the last video. A berberine can help with weight loss, correct? Berberine can reduce fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver at that. Berberine helps with dementia, 2021. So there are a lot of good things on and on and on I've talked about before, but the one thing that they leave out, biomission, is that it will block muscle synthesis. And so therefore you have to think about what is your reason for doing this? If you are not diabetic, and you don't have these outrageous labs that need to be corrected, then I wouldn't do it. I'm not doing berberine. I don't have the need to do berberine. Is it going to give me some magical power? I, you get into trouble when you start thinking that way. I'll just take this pill. I'll just take this pill. And well, I don't have to be so careful with, those, with the foods that I eat and so on and so forth. That's not entirely true. So if you are suppressing your body's ability to produce muscle mass, MPS, muscle protein synthesis, because you're taking berberine, you may want to think twice about doing this. Take care. Next time.